It's so good to be able to stand here. And, you know, I um, was sharing with the earlier services that I think I just recovered from flu. Thursday, Friday, my nose was just blocked and drippy. And, and um, you know, the medication that I took knocked me out last night. It's still making me very thirsty. Um, you know, but by the gracious hand of God, I can still be here. And let me tell you this. <laughs> you can give God the praise and offering. Let me tell you this first. You know, I, I just want to say this. No matter the circumstances, just look to God for strength. Sometimes you see your pastor, you know, or whoever's standing here, even the worship team, we look all okay, you know. But we, we go through difficult times as well. And sometimes we do have, you know, to go through uh, storms and, you know, there will be winds and there will be waves. But, but what we have just declared that even those, they know who God is. So nothing will hold us back. You know, I'm not asking you to pretend that nothing is wrong with your life. I think we, we can be honest people. But what is important is despite our struggles and despite what we are going through in life, may we always look to the Lord for strength and know that He is with us. And if our God is for us, no circumstances can stand against us. Even if my life on earth is going to end as a wreck, even if I am going to be hung because of my faith in Him, I know it is well with my soul. Because this house, this world is not my permanent home. My place is in the place of glory that the Lord has prepared for each and every one of us, including you. For did Jesus not say, in my Father's house there are many rooms? And He has already prepared it for us and He will bring us home. So you need to know, this world is not our home. So whatever you're going through, look deeper and have a deeper understanding of who God is, that at the end of the day, what matters is our lives are already in Him. And we return to Him when we breathe our last here on earth. I'm saying this almost like a funeral sermon. Because I need you to hear this and not say it when you are lying in that coffin, you know. I need you to hear it while you can. So those who have ears hear what the Lord is saying to us. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, go here or not. Well, today is the final installment of Ashes to Beauty and we will be looking at the beauty of honouring God. The slides will be up. Yep, so this is the final installment. And before we go into the Word, let us pray for illumination. Together, church, one voice. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the Scriptures are read and your Word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Now, as we come to the close of our sermon series, do know that there are two parts to the book of Nehemiah. The first half, chapters 1 to 7, deals with the restoration of the wall, while the latter half, chapters 8 to 13, deals with the restoration of the people. And our sermon series will end somewhere in between with nine hours. So this is not a nine-point sermon, just nine hours, okay? And they are reinstitution of worship, reinstatement of duties, reoccupation of Jerusalem, return of the exiles, registration of the people, resettlement of the people, reading of the word, response of the people, and release of the people. Now let us begin with the reinstitution of worship, looking at Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 1. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. Now, church, upon completion of the rebuilding project, the very first thing that the people did was to honour God. The singers and the Levites were appointed to lead the people in a time of celebratory worship. Now, this tells us that the walls were not rebuilt for mere aesthetical purposes. The walls were rebuilt so that with the reinstitution of worship, the people could rediscover their identity as the people of God and to worship Him in all majesty with greater freedom and joy. Something they could not freely do when in exile. Now, next we have the reinstatement of duties. 
I put in charge of Jerusalem, my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. Now that the rebuilding project is over, Nehemiah handed the charge of Jerusalem over to two godly men, Hanani and Hananiah. Now in doing so, it became clear that Nehemiah did not take on the rebuilding project for personal glory, unlike his enemies' accusations in earlier chapters. While we do not know if these two men had the necessary competencies to manage a city, but we know, we know, while we do not know if they can manage it or not, if they see or not, we do not know. But we know that they had what it takes to look after God's business, integrity and reverence for the Lord. And Nehemiah said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are, are not to be opened until the sun is hot, while the gatekeepers are still on duty. Have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint the residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their post and some near their own houses. While the completion of the wall indicated a tremendous victory, Nehemiah refused to let his guard down, nor would he allow the people to be complacent. Hence, his advice to Hanani and Hananiah was that the people would have to play their part by guarding all entry points diligently. The gates would only be open when it is bright so that they can see what's happening and it must be bolted shut at all times. You don't just leave it open. You see, a complacent and unguarded city is vulnerable to attacks. And since the restoration of the war is for the restoration of the people and the reinstitution of worship, Nehemiah was more concerned that the latter is being preserved. Next is the reoccupation of Jerusalem. Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it and the houses had not been rebuilt. So my God put into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. And I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. Now church, city walls without people guarding it, they are useless. But walls providing security to an empty city also defeats its purpose of being built especially when the objective was to bring the people home to a place of safe dwelling. Hence, God put in Nehemiah's heart plans to grow and prosper the city of Jerusalem. So what we have next is the return of the exiles. Um, and verses 5b all the way to 65 record their homecoming. Church, please spare me from reading the entire list. However, I would like to call your attention to verses 61 to 65, which is the registration of the people. Now, the following came out from the towns of Tel Mala, Tel Hasha, Karub, Adon, and Ima, but they could not show that their families were descended from Israel. I'm going to skip to the next verse. Those, these people, they searched for their family records but they could not find them and so were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor therefore ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until there should be a priest ministering with the Urim and Thummim. Now just let me pause a while. Urim and Thummim are not like some ingredients or some food. It's something on the breastplate of the priest, okay? It's, uh, uh, Uri means light and Fumi means God's perfection. It's probably used for some consultation or divination purposes. We do not know how they use it, but that, that's what it means. And if you search it, you'll see that it appears a couple of times in the Old Testament Bible. Now, what we have here, these verses list untraceable exiles, meaning people who could not prove that their families descended from Israel. And these people, they searched for their family records, but they could not find them. And so they were excluded as unclean until further consultation. Now, when I read these verses, I was touched by how these supposedly new immigrants wanted to be accepted as God's chosen people and to be part of His blessings. These people, they had travelled from afar and had done, I assume, extensive searches for their family records, hoping to be included in the community. 
Now, I wonder how many of us seated here have the same longing and enthusiasm about our identity in Christ now that we have been included in God's kingdom. In these verses, we see people trying so hard to be included. Yet church and the freedom uh, of worship or the freedom to worship, they do not seem as precious to many people today. Something for us to reflect upon. Don't take your membership and who you are as sons and daughters of God for granted. Moving on. Verses 69, uh, 66 to 69 uh, capture a precise consolidation of people, helpers, animals, etc. Verses 70 to 72 record the contributions of the people to the rebuilding work and the blessings to the priest. I won't go into the details here. And verse 73a saw to the resettlement of the people. Now, at this point, depending on your Bible versions, you may find Nehemiah chapter 7 merging into chapter 8 seamlessly to give us an overview of what took place after the people settled down. And they honoured God with the reading of the Word. Okay, so some of you, if you look at your Bibles, the last chapter, the last verse of 7 and then to 8, it could be just seamless. For your information, the the way the original text is written, there's no full stop, no comma. All these verses are put in later for our easy references, okay? For us, uh, for easier referencing uh, to the Word of God. Let me just read from 73, second part of it. When the seventh month came and the Israelites settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak to noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Now church, the first thing the people requested was for the law of the Lord to be read to them. And Ezra, the high priest, read it from day break to noon. And the people listened attentively. We'll talk more about this in a little while. Because the next four verses... Verses 4 to 8 gave a detailed account of what we have just read so that we get to see the response of the people. Now, Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. And Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen. Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that people understood what was being read. Now, because Ezra stood on a platform, the people were able to see what he was doing. And when they saw Ezra opening the word in reverence they stood up and remained standing while the word is being read and mind you Ezra read from daybreak till noon this is not a five minute reading of the word I wonder how many of us can take it if we read through you know a few chapters of, of, of scriptures and all of you are to stand it's not easy but yet the people stood in honour in respect of God's word and when Ezra praised the Lord, the people lifted their hands and affirmed with a twofold Amen. This is why we lift our hands when we sing our threefold Amen. All right, this is in praise of God. The people then bowed down before the Lord in reverence and worshipped Him with their faces to the ground. They feel unworthy to even look at God face to face. Hence, the posture is head down. And because the Holy Scripture was with the people and the anointing was with the priests and the Levites, the people were able to understand what was being taught and read. Uh, being taught and being read to them. This is 
This is truly a beautiful moment. This is truly a beautiful moment. We'll talk more about this in a little while. Now, I'm just going to digress a little to highlight and share something that uh, perhaps it will be interest for some of us. Now, even though Ezra was mentioned here, both he and Nehemiah did not seem to have any contact or knowledge of each other, which was rather strange given um, their prominence in the rebuilding and restoration of Jerusalem. If you look through, there's no conversation between them. They two look like they do not know each other. Now, most biblical scholars accepted this as editorial glosses. Editorial glosses inserted to create a relationship between the two of them. And it will be helpful for us to know that most of the Old Testament writers, their interests were not in historical accuracy. Recorded events were selectively highlighted for their importance, for their relevance, for their significance. And you know, what's important is also the people's response to it without any particular concern for a chronological presentation of timeline. And once we understand this, many of the contradictions in the Bible will begin to make sense. They are not interested in accuracy of timeline. They are more interested in the significance of the events. This explains why the dedication of the walls, now the walls is being completed, but this explains why the dedication of the walls was delayed until Nehemiah chapter 12. Because it was done only after, because to them, what is important and what is of greater significance is the reinstitution of worship and the reading of the word. In other words, the dedication of the walls were done only after the word and after the worship had their impact on the people and the community. Simply put, completed walls will not come before God and God's covenantal relationship with His people because walls do not change people. It is the Word of God that changes people. It is the worship of God that changes people. Walls do not change people. So what if the walls are being completed? It's not going to transform or change the people. But it is the reinstitution of worship and the reading of the Word and honouring God's Word. That, was, that is what is going to change us and transform us. And from the way the people requested that God's word be read to them tells us that something has taken place in their hearts. It was to a reform and transform people to whom the word of God was being read, were being read to. And finally, the last four verses saw the release of the people. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send, to, send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites calmed all the people saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink and to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. You know, church, something phenomenal happened here. As the word was being read and God's laws were being taught, the people who were listening attentively began to weep. And, what, and, and I believe what took place that very moment was a God encounter or a God moment that led to true repentance. The people finally understood how much God loved and cared for them despite them turning against His laws. The exile was a wake-up call for them to sin no more, a call for all disobedient and all hardened hearts to return. And despite their unworthiness, God provided a restored Jerusalem, His holy city, for them to return home and at the same time have their status restored as His chosen people. And Nehemiah released the people by saying, let's wipe away our tears for the past is the past. Today is a holy day set apart to worship a great God who is faithfully with us and for us. So let us celebrate victoriously because the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord our God is our source of strength, our source of help, our source of provision, our source of hope and our source of comfort. And even though the going was tough, 
God has given us victory, so be at peace. Go and enjoy choice food and drink sweet drinks and remember to share with those who have none. Now church, I'm going to end the reading from the book of Nehemiah here. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ashes to beauty. What has the book of Nehemiah taught us? Let me begin by saying that the book of Nehemiah taught us a lot about who our God is. But for us to have a holistic view of you know, God's gracious hand at work, we cannot talk about the book of Nehemiah apart from the book of Ezra because both books represent a pivotal moment in history for the chosen people of God, us included. Zerubbabel led the first, if you look at the book of Ezra, you'll find that Zerubbabel led the first return of the people to Jerusalem and saw to the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra led the second return of the people and saw to the reorientation of a degraded faith community, degraded because they were intermarrying and they were not honouring the Lord. Nehemiah led the people in the repairing of the walls and saw to the restoration of God's broken people as God's chosen people. With all this, without all this happening, the Israelites could not have remained as a holy people chosen and set apart for God's greater purpose. Without all this happening, there might not have been Judaism or even Christianity. And this tells us that the God whom we worship was and is and will always be a restorative God. The exile of the Jews was a deserved punishment because they had ignored God's warning of banishment if they disobeyed His laws. And if you think about it, there was nothing the people could have done. There's nothing the people could have done, especially when in exile, to save themselves from the plight they had landed themselves in. Yet, by the gracious hand of a restorative God, the book of Ezra opens with King Cyrus issuing a royal decree that permitted the exiled Jews in Babylon to return home and to rebuild the temple. And the book of Nehemiah opens with King Artaxerxes issuing a royal decree that permitted the rebuilding of broken city walls. Amazingly, God's gracious hand of faithfulness through an unlikely source provided for the people the means of return, restoration, rebuilding, and repentance. Ashes to beauty, the very empire that caused the people's exile was now the one aiding in the restoration process. You think about it. And the books of Ezra and Nehemiah saw all this as the providential work of God's redemptive grace and covenantal love for His people. And that's the beauty of honouring God simply because He is faithful. And despite our unworthiness and despite our disobedience, God faithfully keeps to His part of the promise. Hence, every milestone archived um, every milestone archived in these books, if you look at it, you know, every milestone archived and achieved by the community in these two books were punctuated with celebration, celebrations of worship and thanksgiving in honour, in honour of a faithful and covenantal God. Now, besides knowing the Father's heart, there's also much to learn from the man named Nehemiah. Even though we do not know much about him as a cup bearer or as the governor of Judah, we have much to learn from his life practices through his personal walk with God. Nehemiah was a prayerful man who saw himself under greater authority. And the greater authority is not an earthly, just the earthly one. His greater authority is who God is to him. Nehemiah was a prayerful man who saw himself under greater authority. With a heart only for God and God's people, he was a man deeply conscious of God's guidance in his life. In and through God, Nehemiah was able to find spiritual wisdom, discernment and strength to triumph over all obstacles. And he attributed his success and strength to God and God alone. Hence, he did not take any credit for the work done. Neither did he assume he could have done it through his own wisdom and leadership abilities. You know, Nehemiah's exemplary faith reminds us of our calling as the church of Jesus Christ. He did not come to serve out of self-interest. 
Nehemiah did not serve to be liked. He did not serve to be remembered. He did not serve to look good. He did not serve for self-gain. He did not serve just because that was his passion, his interest or his hobby. He served because he loved his God and his people. And Nehemiah served diligently because he saw the restoration of the Israelites from a disgraced community to God's chosen people once again, a privileged second chance that cannot be squandered. So while Nehemiah's ways of doing things may come across as stubborn and strict, his greater mission was to make right the relationship between God and God's people. Hence the rebuilding of broken walls for the reinstitution of worship and word. But Nehemiah's intention was not to wall up a community of well-behaved people. The separatist mentality was first a call to purity before the fulfilment of God's mission to the world can take place. The need to set ourselves apart from anything unclean or sinful was not about being exclusive, but adequately, but to adequately prepare ourselves for God's greater plan, a plan that has yet to unfold at this time. Which was why the book of Nehemiah did not end on a perfect note, because all the events that took place under Nehemiah or even Ezra, or even Zerubbabel, were not God's final word for all humanity. The ministry of reconciliation between God and God's people was never meant to be fully realised during Ezra or Nehemiah's time. So what's the point to this book? The return of the people, God's people to Jerusalem, served to demonstrate the fact that God had acted. And the endings to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were silently paving the way for God to act again on behalf of His people as a fulfillment of His commitment to the covenant in the divine plan of salvation through the advent of Christ. While Nehemiah's perfect leadership may seem like a lost cause to some, we must not give up hope that the final perfection is found in the redemptive work of the cross through our Lord and Saviour, our risen Lord and Saviour, Jesus. And Paul made it very clear in 1 Corinthians 3 that while we do the planting and watering of seeds, it is God who makes it grow. So my friends, it is clear that even though humanly there's only so much we can do, we still need to do our work in unity as a team and to give of our best. So then, Whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those of the family of faith. You know, sometimes we think, Ayo, like this, my son don't do anything. No, we still have our parts to play. The work of the cross is done, not the work of the church. Hence, it is imperative that our relationship with God and our understanding of the Word are not just intellectually driven, but rooted in a heart filled with faith, hope and love and it is in God's faithfulness that we are able to find that needed strength and grace to overcome you know all personal struggles inadequacies and even self-condemnation self-condemnation some of us don't even like what we see in the mirror some of us don't even like who we are but I want you to know this God loves you and you are created in His image. Learn to accept yourself for who you are. I know sometimes we envy people of better figure, people with more hair. But God created you the way you are. The numbers of hair on your head is numbered. He knows that's your destiny. That's it. Just accept it. When you look at the mirror, say, this is how God looks like. Because He created us in His image. Hence, we need to hold on to the hope of God's faithfulness as His chosen people in this covenantal community. You need to know who you are and whose you are before you can even attempt to show the world who God is. This is important. But church, we also need to set our lives apart for His purpose and glory. Only then, in faith, hope and love, would the redeemed and consecrated have something different to offer to those who are living their lives apart from the Creator. Amen to that?
you solve. Amen to that. So church, this concludes our sermon series, Ashes to Beauty, on the book of Nehemiah. You know, I pray that the sermons have been helpful to you in your own personal journey or perhaps in your CG and that the past weeks have been a blessing to you at an opportune time, not any time near, but at an opportune time, perhaps in five more sermons, we will complete the rest of the book of Nehemiah. But for now, remember this. Only God can and only God will turn the ashes in our lives into beauty simply because He loves he cares and He is faithful. So let us celebrate victoriously. And like the people mentioned in the book of Nehemiah, we too have been redeemed and restored. And in Christ, our names are registered in His book of life for all eternity. So let me end with this. Do not weep anymore, for this day is holy to the Lord. Go and enjoy choice food, and drink sweet drinks. What is the official drink for CMC? Coke Light. Coke, C-O-K-E. Christ our King Eternal. So go and enjoy choice food and drink sweet drinks. And remember to share with those who have none. Why share with those who have none? So that we can also share with them the beauty of honouring God. Not just any God, but a covenantal and restorative God whose name is love. And because of His great love for us, He is a God who is always for us and with us. He is a God who always fight for us. Turn to your neighbour and say, Whiting! And in Him, in this faithful God, in this restorative God, in this covenantal God, in Him, we will never walk alone. Which is why the joy and the presence of the Lord is our strength. So church, this ends the sermon series. Take care and God bless you. May all glory be unto God.